Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, wherever you may be in the world today. But we want to welcome to today's live broadcast, The Surgeon's Toolbox. Outcomes are only as good as the contents of the box. I am Marcel Perregentil, and I will be your moderator for this session. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon on the lower right corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button on the lower left side of the window. I would like to introduce today's speaker and my very good friend, Dr. Shepan Baran. Dr. Baran earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Animal Science from the University of Delaware, a veterinary medical doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania, and a Master of Science degree from the University of Washington. Dr. Baran is head of innovative animal technologies and training at Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. His current work centers on the refinement and development of surgical and biomethodology training programs, including efficiency and objective competency and proficiency assessment. I will now turn it over to Dr. Stefan Baran for his presentation. So take it on, Stefan. On, Stefan. On, Stefan. Thank you so much, Marcel, uh, for the introduction and for moderating the session. Also, I'd like to thank all the participants for joining uh, us for this session. And I'm very excited talking about uh, this topic that very often is omitted uh, when we talk about surgery. One of the things I do want to mention at the beginning is that we're going to be addressing um, mainly rodent surgery uh, because rodents are the largest portion of the animals that we utilize. And also folks that utilize those species don't necessarily have that veterinary, surgical, or medical background. But a lot of the items that we're going to talk about can also translate into other areas of surgery and other species. So when we're going to talk about surgical instrumentation, we're going to be addressing proper selection. We're also going to discuss why we need appropriate instrumentation. We're going to touch up on quality of the instruments. We're going to also talk about surgical procedures um, that are required to think about when you are looking at the packages of the instruments that you would like to utilize. We're also going to spend actually quite a bit of time on ergonomics. Um, and again, that's one of the areas that very often we do not pay attention to, but it's extremely import important. And we're going to talk about proper implementation of the instruments um, into the surgical procedures and in the selection process. So what are some of the challenges that we face with selecting instruments in the biomedical field, in a laboratory animal science field? So one, lack of surgical background and specialization. So like I mentioned, most folks that perform rodent surgery don't have surgical medical or veterinary background. Um, so it's very varied. Uh, so you have PhD students, undergrad students, um, veterinary technicians, um, animal technicians, um, and other technical staff. There are also a lot of companies that sell surgical instrumentation. And there's lack of nomenclature standardization. So one instrument can be called something different by different companies, which makes it very challenging identifying exactly what you need and also comparing between different companies. On a human surgery side, at the medical centers, they have procurement specialists. So that's an actual job of a person there, that's their full-time job to assist with 
procurement of various surgical instrumentation and equipment uh, for surgical facilities for the surgeon. In most facilities, we don't have a person that specializes in that area. So again, we have to identify what instrumentation and um, what equipment we need. There's very often, um, there are standard kits um, available. Uh, so for example, if you search for rodent surgery um, or mouse or rat surgical kits um, in any of the search engines, you're gonna find quite a few companies selling those kits. Uh, but very often those kits are composed of five or six instruments. Um, and those might be appropriate for maybe one or two procedures, but they're not appropriate for more complex procedures. So for example, what I have seen is that with those packages, those five, six instruments, surgeons will try to perform subcutaneous implantation um, of a pump, for example, all the way to a kidney transplant. And really that's not appropriate and we'll discuss that in more detail uh, why that is. So when we think about appropriate instrumentation, um, the reason for selecting the instruments that would give us high, better outcomes, it's gonna allow us to optimize the procedural outcome. It's gonna also thereby decrease the confounding factors. It's certainly gonna decrease mortality and morbidity. And in the long term, it's gonna decrease the expense. So during this presentation, we're gonna spend, like I mentioned before, quite a bit of time addressing ergonomics. Then we're gonna step into selection and procurement of surgical instrumentation. The topics we're not gonna address, but are also very important, um, are magnification and illumination equipment, and also supportive equipment required, for example, for monitoring the animal, which is also helpful for the surgeons. So for example, if I'm doing a catheterization of the left ventricle in a rat, I would like to see how the animal is responding to that. But again, that's type of equipment we're not gonna be addressing today. So do ergonomics matter during rodent surgery? And why? So you guys have a chat function there. So I'm gonna give you a few you know, 30 or 60 seconds or so for you guys to type in your answers there. Why would ergonomics potentially help you during surgery? And you can use that Q&A function there. So we're getting some responses here. It's yes, repetitive motion syndrome. And most of you guys agree that it's important. And obviously it does. Often many surgeries are done and fatigue will cause errors. Ergonomics reduce hand and body fatigue, increase speed and therefore outcome. Yes, explanation mark, more efficient surgery less strain on the surgeon, multiple surgeries in a row. So great, so I really appreciate your responses here. So it might seem like maybe we're talking to the choir here, but at the same time, we're gonna address three areas of ergonomics. Uh, so hopefully it will be something new to you guys as well. So do ergonomics really matter? So unaware, of physical and mental fatigue that the surgeon must withstand to complete procedures. So folks who do not have experience in surgery, for example, PhD students, um, it might be challenging for them to understand the fatigue that you can undergo. It's also challenging for folks without that background to grasp the importance of ergonomically comfortable surgical instruments to outcome of surgical procedures. So one of the facts I'll to bring up here that the um, food and respiration 
uh, did a survey, and it estimated 50% of 1.3 million unintentional patient injuries per year in United States hospitals are due to poor design of medical instruments. I thought those are pretty impressive facts, which goes along with the ergonomics, but also why you need the appropriate instrumentation for surgical procedures. So we're going to cover three subdivisions of ergonomics, or subclasses, physical, cognitive, and organizational. So physical ergonomics, as you can imagine, is going to deal with the surgeon's posture, biomechanics, how the surgeon is moving or able to move, repetitive motions, also the surgical area layout, and handling of instruments and sutures. So physical ergonomics are influenced by multiple factors. You have viewing, sitting, and space, and we'll address those in more detail. So for example, for viewing, when you're performing a rodent laparoscopy, it's important to how you place the monitor when you're visualizing what you're doing in the animal. So the monitor height should be 25 degrees below horizontal plane of your eyes. And for procedures, when surgeons change position, so if you have multiple entries um, into the abdomen, you should have two or even three monitors. And those monitors are not only helpful for you, but also helpful for your assistants. When you talk about microsurgery, uh, it might be seemed um, something that we necessarily think about using screens for microsurgery, but there is a initiation or a small movement that's utilizing monitors that are attached to microscopes to perform microsurgery. And it's something that it, the advantages of it that you can see everything on a screen, on a large screen. You don't have to lean over the microscope. Um, but there's also some challenges with that as well. But for the placement of that um, monitor, it should be between 10 to 25 degrees below line of sight. And the main challenge with utilizing monitors for microsurgery, if you're not used to them, is really the experience with them and getting used to utilizing them. Sitting position is extremely important. You really have to have an adjustable chair. And the way you should be sitting, that the spine should be in a neutral position your hip and knee in straight line and parallel to the floor, and your feet should be resting flat on the floor. Very often what I see is that shorter folks will prop themselves with uh, their toes, and taller people will sit in a position where their knees are above their hips, and again, it introduces additional stress uh, to your body. Lower leg should be perpendicular to the floor, so really, your knees um, and your hips should be at a 90-degree angle, and your feet as well. Neck should also be aligned with the spine and not hunched forward or leaning back, um, because again, it's going to introduce additional stress and fatigue um, on your body. Hand positioning is also very important, um, and that's something, again, very often when I visit different facilities, they have seen we don't really pay a lot of attention to that. So movement of the arms uh, should be at or below your wrist uh, when you're performing rodent surgery. And really, ideally, you should rotate your fingers um, or your wrist uh, to minimize the motions. Because again, any, even micro motions, you know, half a millimeter to a millimeter when you're performing a, for example, vascular anastomosis in a mouse or a rat uh, could have a detrimental effect. Your forearms should be rested, uh, and that's to limit the shoulder fatigue, as well as provide stability. So one of the things that we use commonly is saline bags, um, that you can place your forearms um, on them and provide you with the stability and ability also to move those forearms um, without being just on a flat surface. And also, what's really important is that the tools that you're utilizing should be within your reach, uh, so that you're not leaning all the way over 
to grab something from one side um, or another side. And ideally, you should place your instruments in the same position each time. So not only for an ergonomical perspective, but also you don't have to um, step away from or move away uh, from the microscope. So then your eyes would have to refocus back and forth. So you're losing that time there as the animals anesthetize. So you want to have those instruments um, in the same spot um, so you can just easily reach and grab them. So space, um, this slide is left blank on purpose because the main point of it that you need a lot of space. And most of the time, we don't have enough space, for, especially for rodent surgery. Most of us don't have surgical suites dedicated to rodent surgery. A lot of times rodent surgeries perform on benches. We have a lot of other things um, in those areas. So really you need to make sure that you have enough space. And whatever space you think is enough, uh, I would recommend doubling or tripling that area. You also have to consider with that space additional equipment uh, that we very briefly mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So physiological monitoring, good rent, your anesthesia setup, you know, your instruments so they are nicely laid out um, and you're not uh, searching, wasting time searching for them. So usually the tables that um, we utilize are at least five feet, uh, but usually about six feet in length and about 40 centimeters um, in, in width. So now let's talk about cognitive ergonomics. So we talked about physical ergonomics. Now we're going to switch and talk about cognitive ergonomics. So cognitive ergonomics encompass things such as mental stress on the surgeon, both with the workload and decision-making, as well as having a skillful surgical outcome. So a surgeon might be stressed because they have to perform so many procedures within a day that they might have a very tight schedule. Also, when you have to perform, for example, 20, 30 catheterizations, you might see that the first surgery, second surgery is patent right now, but you're not sure if it's going to be patent two, three, four, five days down the road. But at the same time, you continue to perform the same procedure. So that can play an impact. Also, the relationship of the surgeon with that equipment. So if you are new to the equipment, if you bring a new surgical instrument into your facility, starting to utilize, that could also add stress uh, to that surgeon. One would like to make sure that the surgeon is competent and proficient because that, if you're not sure how to perform a procedure, would have an impact on how stressed you are. Um, it's very important to have an eye and hand coordination. You need to be confident, and that goes along with the competency and proficiency. But if you're not confident, again, it's just going to add additional stress to the surgeon. You want to make sure that you're rested before surgery, you know, that you don't have one or two hours of sleep uh, because one, you're going to fatigue a lot faster. You're going to be stressed as well. You also want to make sure, talking about stress here, you don't want to be overly stressed. Uh, so you really want to plan appropriately. And also, stress can be brought on by being pressed for time. So like I already mentioned, if you're doing, you know, 30, 40, 50 procedures within a day, that's certainly going to uh, put pressure on you. And um, even if consciously you don't think you're being stressed, uh, the stress is definitely there. So now we're going to talk about organizational ergonomics. So these include communication with the surgical and investigational team, um, also quality assurance. So how do you make sure that your setup is appropriate and the outcomes are appropriate? proper delegation of duties to your members of your team. So you want to work with people who are going to be providing you with the animals. And again, I know that with rodent surgery, very often we're responsible for everything. Um, but at least you can work with your team helping you uh, bringing the animals or during the surgical procedure, uh, making sure that you have everything there that's needed for the surgery. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. 
really the culture of the workplace environment. So you want to, in an area where you're performing surgery, you want to make sure that there is not a lot of traffic there. And again, this could be a significant challenge when you're working in a lab setting. So you work in a lab bench and other people are coming through and running around um, and potentially interfering with your surgical uh, procedure. So you really want to communicate with everybody in your area that you're going to be doing a procedure. You want to identify the support staff, and that's something um, that uh, a few studies have been done showing on the human surgical side that, and when I'm using human, uh, I'm talking about medical centers where they perform surgeries on humans. Um, and in those areas, that having the appropriate, competent, and proficient staff really increases um, the out, better outcomes and decreases mortality and morbidity. So planning, so as a surgeon, if all the aspects around the surgery have not been planned out well, that's going to also put stress on you because you're going to think, do I have the appropriate analgesics um, that I'm going to use after surgery um, or where those an analgesics used appropriately pre-surgically? Medications, uh, depending on or compounds, depending what studies you're performing. Patient preparation to make sure that you have everything available for that patient. So, for example, drapes, you know, all those different things. Um, a septic technique is also very, very important. Um, and again, we're not going to be addressing that, that here, um, but it's something that's been addressed at that, at, at during other presentations uh, within this conference. And the anesthetic protocols. So as a surgeon, if you're doing a thoracic surgery, you want to make sure that everything is addressed and you have the appropriate anesthetics, but also appropriate anesthetic setup because any of those things um, are going to put additional stress on you. And for example, if, the if you're just the one who's performing surgery, if you need to adjust the anesthesia, uh, you want to make sure that it's set up in the right um, area and easily reachable to you as a surgeon. So when we think about organizational ergonomics, we should consider the micro environment and the macro environment. So the micro environment is right around the animal where you're performing the surgical procedure. The macro environment is the whole room, for example. So like if you work in a lab setting, again, people coming in and out, uh, different equipment being in your way potentially. So you really should assess both of those environments. You also want to make sure that you have enough sterile instruments. So if you're performing multiple procedures within a day, do you have enough packs available? So you're not running out and trying to grab instruments between the surgeries, or even worse, during the surgeries. And that also goes along with all of the other pieces of equipment. So for example, like suture, if you drop a suture on the floor or um, on off the sterile area and you have to replace it, you don't want to need to get up and go get that suture. You should have the suture available um, and placed in easily re reachable area. Also, scheduling uh, surgical procedures is very important, um, and that applies specific, specifically if you're doing multiple surgeries within a day. And usually, you're going to things uh, are going to happen and potentially go wrong, so you want to make sure that you give yourself enough time in between the surgeries and for the surgeries. So again, you don't have that stress uh, upon you that the number of surgeries that you have, everything has to go the right way. And again, stacking of consumable surgical supplies. So I already mentioned suture material, uh, but anything else that you would need, even some basic things like gauze, you want to make sure that that's available and within an easy reach um, of where you're sitting. So just to summarize um, ergonomics, there are three categories that we should consider, physical, cognitive, and organizational. And it's really important that each one of these categories um, is addressed and optimized um, as much as possible in order to have successful surgical outcome, which is going to lead to appropriate or good data and decrease the confounding factor.
So now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about selection and procurement of surgical instrumentation. So in appropriate instrumentation, selection increases risk of incorrect tissue handling and surgical complication. So whenever you're thinking about identifying instruments or purchasing instruments, you really should keep this in mind. And obviously we'll talk about in more detail in the next few slides. So appropriate instrument, instruments are for intended surgical procedures. So like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, if you're thinking about doing a kidney transplant, you're gonna need very different instrumentation if you're performing a subcutaneous um, pump implantation or even a heart transplant or a gastric bypass a procedure. Yeah, that could be in rodents or even larger species. Because those appropriate instruments will allow you to perform your procedure correctly and it's gonna to lead to appropriate outcome. So the instrument properties that you should consider are the ergonomics of the instruments, the quality, longevity, as well as affordability. So it's really important to remember that most instruments are designed with one or two principal functions. So for example, a hemostats, you should not utilize them as needle holders. Another example, using microsurgical needle holder um, to grab suture. You should use it to grasp and hold and maneuver microsurgical needles and not suture material. If you do that, it's going to weaken the suture, which can lead to tearing and potentially dehiscence um, of your anastomosis site um, or closure. Also, grasping larger needles with microsurgical instruments can lead to a damage of those um, and wear, increase the wear and tear on them. So then when you are actually trying to grasp smaller needles, it's going to be very challenging to do. So suture holders um, are very often used um, or not actually not utilized in microsurgery because very often we use other instruments to grasp suture. So you, there are appropriate instruments for that, for handling suture material. They're very often also referred as tie forceps, but they allow you to grasp microsuture, for example, 10, 11, or 12 out. But they're more delicate um, than your needle holders. And again, they do not damage the suture material. So here are some of the resources and this PowerPoint presentation will be available uh, to you afterwards. So you have a copy of these. Um, but one of the resources is uh, Dr. Hoyt uh, who does um, microsurgical workshops at ALAS for quite a bit now. He does a basic and advanced a workshop and you can learn quite a bit there and he goes over a lot of these items in, in quite detail uh, and there are some other resources that are listed here which I would um, suggest uh, catching up on because one of the challenges there for laboratory animal science especially for rodent surgery there are not a lot of resources uh, and also if there are other resources that are available we'd love to hear from you if you could let us know. So we also need to consider instrument size and length. So an appropriate size of the instrument is gonna to lead to poor surgical technique. So for example, if your needle holders are too large, they're gonna hinder grasping of the microsurgical needle. Um, and if they're too big, for example, manipulating that needle within the abdomen of a mouse will be challenging. If the needle holders are too large, they can also change the shape of the needle which will increase the tissue drag as you pulling the needle through the tissues, which is gonna cause tissue trauma, which can, or it does, increase the risk of uh, infection. It also decreases surgical precision, and you can exaggerate the motions with larger instruments versus having appropriate uh, size needle holders. Instruments with rings, um, that are uh, too large uh, can slip 
but also those that are too small um, can or will restrict blood flow and that's going to lead to finger fatigue and if you're doing something for you know two three four minutes might not be a big deal but if you're doing it over a long period of time it could have a huge impact one of the things that you know you can just imagine if you put a band um, around your finger and keep it on it for a long time that's really tight your finger is going to turn red um, and uh, it's going to lead it's going to be quite painful um, and difficult to be precise with it so same thing when you instruments uh, with rings are too small one of the other aspects that's really important is also matching the surgeon's hand size to that instrument so for example someone with bigger hands is not going to utilize the same instrumentation that someone who has very small hands. And again, that's one of the challenges with the rodent kits that are available out there. Uh, that with those five, six instruments, um, really, they're not applicable for every size of hand. Um, and again, it's like mentioned, the, the type of surgeons or people who are performing rodent surgeries is very, the backgrounds is very diverse. An instrument really needs to be long enough so that they're not operating ends rest on the webbing. So here, if I can just demonstrate uh, holding on a camera, you can see that. So if I'm holding this instrument, it's resting in a webbing between my thumb um, and my um, pointing finger. So that's how the instrument should rest. And if the instrument is too short for that, it's going to decrease um, the ability of you to control that instrument. Also, inappropriate instruments are going to lead to fatigue and increase uh, trembling. And so you want to really minimize that when you have the appropriate instruments, which again, it's going to provide you with optimal control of that instrument, and it's going to allow you to perform your technique correctly and precisely. So thinking about instrument shape is also uh, important. So especially when you talk about microsurgical instrumentation so you have two options you have flat instruments so for example if i can just show this so this is a flat instrument or you can have half round instruments so as you can see this one is flat on this end but then on here is round so when you hold this instrument now again when i need to move the tip of it i can just barely rotate my fingers and it moves that instrument if I have the flat instrument, I'm going to need to do whole motion with my wrist or hand to do that. And again, we want to minimize the amount of motion you're performing because you're working with very, very small structures. And also with that, quite a few of you at the beginning in the chat suggested the repetition um, can lead to fatigue. So same here, if you're moving, instead of just moving your finger, your finger uh, tips, or just moving the whole wrist, again, with the whole wrist that you can imagine, you're going to, if it's being repetitively performed, it's going to lead to more fatigue um, of, your, of your hand and potentially even injury. So weight of the instruments is also something to consider. And this can uh, be a little bit of a challenge. Um, and there's also a certainly surgeon's preference. But we have titanium instruments, which are lighter than stainless steel instruments, and they actually are extremely light. Um, and they decrease the chance of the fatigue because obviously you don't have to hold them uh, as much because they are lighter. But initially, if you are a novice or a beginner, we would recommend using stainless steel instruments because the titanium instruments potentially can be too light for, for you. And that's not going to allow you to control them well. But again, as you become more of an expert, then it's going to be surgeon's preference on what to utilize. For me, for example, for some procedures, I prefer titanium instruments. Um, if I'm working with, for example, vessels or nerves um, and anastomosing those structures uh, versus if, for example, I'm doing a, a wall, an abdominal wall closure. Um, so again, if you're a beginner or novice, stainless steel um, are a good instrument to start off with. And then you can, as you progress with your experience, you can decide if you would like to move to titanium instruments.
So glare of instrument is um, also important, um, and especially when you're working under a microscope. And initially, we might not recognize that, pay attention to it, but over time, it's going to decrease your visual acuity. Um, you have also eye strain as a result of that glare. So there's a few solutions to that. Um, one, you can have sandblasted mid finish, which are also known as brushed metal instruments, or you can have blue anodization of titanium instruments, which eliminate uh, or decrease that glare. But also these days, a lot of if you're using a microscope, um, there's also different functions that you can utilize there uh, to decrease that glare as well, different filters. But again, it's, this is definitely one of those things that most people don't pay attention to. Uh, but if you do start, and I hope you will start paying attention to that, you can definitely see the difference um, in, in, in how your eyes um, are more uh, restful after those procedures. So finances, cost, um, uh, prefer to see it as an investment uh, in the quality of instruments. So there's really a balance there. Uh, but you need to think long term. Uh, you're going to utilize those instruments for multiple procedures. Um, it's going to help you with better outcomes and lead you to better data. So you should utilize um, or think about all those different things when you think about purchasing instruments. And very often I know, you know, purchasing a microsurgical pack that's appropriate can be um, even scary to look at the price tag. But again, if you consider the whole project and what percentage of the project the pricing is, um, I think that having that balance and having the right appropriate surgical instrumentation, the investment is really worth it. So we have a question here. So do you have any thoughts about titanium stainless steel and other materials used for surgical instruments? So I hope I answered that question. Um, if I did not, please let me know. So when you think about identifying trustworthy surgical suppliers, it definitely can be challenging these days because a lot of the purchasing that we do is online. We don't go into the stores to look at the instruments uh, or actually see them. Uh, but really, when you, there's a couple of things that can help you do that. So manufacturer's mark should be visible on each instrument. If it's not, I would really think twice about purchasing those instruments. And manufacturers should stand by their instruments and replace them if they are found to be damaged, but not even damaged. Even if they're not aligning correctly, if they're not cutting appropriately. So all those different things, you know, especially if you're spending, you know, twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars uh, on microsurgical um, instrument, you really want to make sure that you have appropriate instrument. But also, when you receive the instruments you should really check them right away. And there's different tests that you can do uh, to make sure that instruments are working correctly before you actually utilize those in surgery. So I would never recommend buying, getting, receiving a new pack, autoclaving it, and then utilizing them in surgery, especially when you think about microsurgical instruments, but even in larger instruments, uh, macro instruments as well. For example, forceps might not align correctly. So all those things should be um, assessed before you jump into doing surgery. But really, if you can find uh, the sellers that have their manufacturer's mark on the instrument, but also are willing to stand by their instrument, um, I, mo in most cases, you will be in, in, in good hands. So also considering using the instrument, so how are you going to use them, the frequency of utilization. And this is where it really comes in, having, spending a little bit more on those instruments uh, makes a huge, huge difference. Because poorly designed, poorly um, manufactured in instruments like scissors, for example, are going to become dull very, very, very quickly. And again, this is where testing your instruments on uh, the, the quality assurance of instruments is very important. Because if you don't test them, 
um, if you keep end up utilizing it, you might not see how dull, for example, the scissors are if you utilize them on a daily basis. Um, so you should have a quality insurance plan in place to do that, especially if your instruments are used very, very, very commonly on like daily basis or a weekly basis. Considering sterilization processes. So in rodent surgery, um, a lot of us utilize uh, bead sterilizers and it's it's one of those techniques that it's going to make your instruments brittle and dull. So if you utilize microsurgical instruments, um, I would recommend, strongly recommend, not to use bead sterilizers. Because again, those instruments are going to dull and become brittle very, very rapidly. Autoclaving instruments is really ideal, but even before autoclaving the instruments, you want to make sure that you have the appropriate cleaning detergents. Um, to utilize to clean the instruments. Ultrasonic cleaners are really good to get rid of all of the debris that you can't reach with the brush, for example. But also, if you're using ultrasonic cleaners, you want to make sure that you don't shove, you know, 20, 30 inch. I mean, it's going to depend on the size, uh, but most of the tabletops, very often I see where folks put, you know, 10, 20 instruments into one cycle. And as that ultrasonic cleaner works, the instruments when they touch each other, they can also become dull um, and, and brittle as well. So we recommend using ultrasonic cleaners, but also use them appropriately. Consistent lubrication is extremely important. Um, so, you know, using one of the products like, like a surgical milk, um, after your sur instruments are cleaned, um, and you can do that before the instruments are being autoclaved, so again, it's sterile. Uh, but that's going to really prolong um, that amount of time that you can use your instruments. So just as an example, I have a kit that now it's a little bit over probably 12 years or so, um, and I still, it still works quite well. Uh, a microsurgical kit that has about 10 or 12, 10, 11 instruments. Uh, but again, I've been taking care of it quite well and also not sharing the instruments. And I know that can be also very challenging in a group where you have multiple people that utilize uh, surgical instrumentation. But that can be uh, something to consider as well. Again, long term, um, if you are sharing instruments, you're definitely going to replace them uh, more often or should replace them more often. So when you think about appropriate instruments, again, there are a lot of standard kits available out there for rodents, for mice, and rats performing surgeries. But again, you know, having four or five, six instruments um, for all of the different procedures that you're going to utilize uh, is really not appropriate. So you have to consider uh, when you're buying prepackaged surgical kits for mice and, and rats, are they really appropriate for you? There are a couple of companies that are now starting to package them uh, for specific procedures. So for example, doing uh, catheterization, uh, procedures um, or gastrointestinal procedures. Also, in this discriminant use of instruments, so what we talked about, uh, you don't want to use your needle holders uh, for um, anything else but holding needles and appropriate size needles. And also, it's really important to remember that mice and rats do not equal larger species. So instruments will be different. Um, and that's the micro instrument as well as the micro instrument. But unfortunately, there's lack of references that are out there. Um, again, going to some of the workshops um, that I mentioned at ALAS with Dr. Hoyt. He also has written a few publications on that as well, describing the instruments, uh, which I referenced in a slide, a few slides before this one. Um, but overall, there's really lack of reference. So ideally, before you spend you know, hours and potentially even days trying to identify what you need, reaching out to someone that has the expert expertise um, in those procedures can be very useful and save you a lot of frustration, not just during the selection process of procuring those instruments, but also during the actual surgical procedures. So in summary, it's really important to address the ergonomics and the different subcategories that we discussed today. Um, and addressing the selection or procurement of surgical instrumentation. Again, spending 
uh, money up front, or I should say investing money up front, is really worthwhile long term. And again, there's quite a few topics we didn't address today, like the magnification, illumination, and uh, supporting equipment, how to procure that as well. Um, but again, it's something that if you are thinking about procuring, is talking to someone who has the expertise um, and chatting with them so you don't necessarily purchase wrong equipment um, that's then just going to sit there and you're going to pretty much waste your money on it. So with that said, I'm going to take questions if there are any. And so let me pass on this to Marcel. Since here is our moderator for today. And so let me pass on. All right, Esteban, uh, thank you very much for the informative presentation. As always, you're in the cutting edge of training and surgery in, in a lab animal program. And I've always drawn a lot from your presentations. And, and But before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A box or button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, is could you uh, comment on the appropriate cleaning of surgical instruments to stretch their life? I think you sort of mentioned that a little bit a couple of slides ago, but do you, do you care to elaborate or have, do you feel this has been answered? Excuse me, I'm trying to pass it on back to you, Stefan. So thank you so much, Marcel, for that uh, for that question. So as regards to cleaning the instruments, um, so one, you should, right after surgery, you should clean them immediately and not let them sit there. If you can't clean them right away, place them in, um, in saline, for example. I should, I'm sorry, not saline, but distilled water. Um, and make sure that they stay moist so they blood or any other contents that you want don't dry out. Also, utilizing appropriate brush. Um, so very often... Uh, with, especially with the microsurgical instruments, um, I see folks utilizing metal brush um, for all of the types of micro and micro instrumentation. Um, and you need to be careful that because you can damage uh, uh, microsurgical instrumentation. So, for example, um, using uh, some of the rougher toothbrushes, it's something that I use, um, and that seemed to be working quite well. Again, then stepping into um, um, the next step, uh, lubricating your instruments um, after autoclaving. Uh, but really, one of the big steps is really eliminating using the bead sterilizers. Um, but, and also utilizing what I mentioned in the presentation, using that, for example, surgical milk will extend the lifetime significantly. But really what's important is to utilize or clean your instruments immediately after you end up using them. And also dry them out. Uh, quickly. Don't let them just um, air dry there ideally. Uh, so what I do is actually I will clean instruments but then also dry them off manually um, and then let them sit there just for some of the areas that I can't and get to dry out and then I move to uh, the next step. The next question comes from Michelle Courtney, Courtney uh, the Scripps Research Institute. How hard should it be to close a pair of thumb forceps? I have found there is a huge difference between them, and sometimes forceps that are hard to press, to press down, to press close, cause me hand fatigue and sore fingers. Is there a rule to use to determine what is an acceptable pressure? <laughs> 
So that's a that's a great question, and so, and I'm hoping I can answer that uh, for you. But a lot of it is going to be um, exper expertise or experience with them. Uh, but one, you want to make sure that they're aligned correctly. But they should press, they should close very easily. If you need to um, put a lot of pressure on them, uh, most likely they're not appropriate. And this is where, if you have a good surgical manufacturer, you can go back to them and mention that. And that, I see that very often with um, microsurgical forceps, for example, where um, it requires quite a bit of uh, strength to actually even close those. Um, and again, it's a relative term strength here when we're talking about that. Um, but they should easily close for you. And then also, even when you haven't closed, it should not require a lot of strength to close them. If you're getting fatigued by just keeping your forceps closed, uh, my recommendation would be to, to change them uh, because you should not. If you're repeating a procedure you know, throughout the whole day, you're certainly going to be slightly fatigued at the end, uh, but not to the extent that um, I believe you're describing um, in this question. Uh, the next question is also from Michelle. If you do not recommend using the hot de-sterilizers, how do you manage your instruments between multiple surgeries? So again, and, and certainly not to answer that, uh, Michelle, or I think most of you guys want to hear, but we're very fortunate for us, we actually have enough kits to do that. Um, but the other part also, for example, if you're doing multiple procedures, now you can um, have also autoclaves. They have very short cycles. Um, I believe they're about 20 minutes or so, so you get, get tabletop autoclaves. So um, if, let's say, you have even three sets, um, you can autoclave the other instruments as you're performing those procedures. Um, and also for the shorter procedures, most likely you won't need you know, 10, 12 instruments. Um, for example, if you're performing a vasectomy, uh, and you need to do multiple of them uh, within a day. Uh, so you're not going to need that many instruments. So buying maybe five or six sets as you're moving forward through them, you can autoclave the other uh, ones um, as you're performing the procedures. So investing in autoclaves, again, getting the ones with the short cycles uh, can be uh, very, very, very useful. One of the things that some folks also do is flashing your instruments. Um, and what that means is that you're putting your instruments um, into an autoclave um, without wrapping them. Uh, so you can decrease uh, that cycle as well. Um, it's something you can potentially use. Um, if, 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 if you're going to have to decide between doing that or beat sterilizer, I would recommend doing that. Uh, but again, that's necessarily not an ideal solution. Uh, but really just having the investment of having a number of, uh, of, of surgical kits um, and having the appropriate autoclave uh, that would be my recommendation. I could probably add to that too, Stepan, is that, and Michelle, that, you know, it's what you're willing to sacrifice. You know, if, if you need to know what you're sacrificing, you're sacrificing quality of instrumentation and and then maybe you need to purchase them more often. So it's just, if you're gonna be using the hot bee sterilizer. Okay, so the next question comes from Russell Hickby from Sanofi Pasteur Vax Design Corporation. Thank you very much, Sepan. Uh, this was a great presentation about often missed topics. These are key points that need to be addressed more frequently, best to you. So that was more of a comment. Thank you, Russell. It's always nice to get good compliments like that. I think Stepan is in the cutting edge of these things. The next question comes from Valerie Schroeder, Schroeder from University of Notre Dame. Is there a way to quantify fatigue in surgeons? So that, that is, a, is an excellent but also challenging question. And I don't really have a good tool to do that. Um, it's something that is really being looked at in the medical centers there where they perform human surgeries. Um, and even there, it's really challenging. So one of the things that they talk about is residents uh, 
you know, pulling, you know, two, three days uh, with one or two hours of sleep um, and what kind of impact that has on surgeries. And there's a lot of publication addressing that. Um, there's also publication on repetition. So, for example, doing um, multiple surgical procedures within, um, you know, within the same day, you know, doing 20, 30, 40 catheterization uh, procedures uh, or vasectomies. Uh, but unfortunately, I do not have a, a great tool. We're, we're working on developing that assessment tool for fatigue. Um, so currently, what I would recommend is really doing the, um, almost like doing an interview. There are specific questions um, that you could ask, and I can share them with you. Um, I believe you have my contact information, or you can reach out to Bioconference Live, and that, that they'll provide you with my contact information. Uh, several questions that you can ask at the end of the day or even uh, at the end of the week uh, with the folks that are performing surgery and you can assess that way. Again, it's not a truly objective tool, uh, but again, it's a fantastic question and not just uh, myself, but a lot of other folks um, in the human surgical field are working on that. So I'm sorry I don't have a, have a great answer for you there for this one. The next question is from Alejandra Flores Gonzalez, Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León. Hello, Alejandra. Thank you for the question. And the question is, do you think that human instruments for surgeries that are performed to the mouth, I think that she's talking about oral, human oral surgical instruments, are optimal for surgeries in rats? So I, I, I love that question because within the last uh, few months, uh, we actually have looked at uh, dental equi equipment uh, varying from surgical instrumentation as well as to even um, surgical microscopes and especially lamps, uh, surgical lamps for that. So we're actually going to be obtaining one uh, here, um, a couple actually at Novartis. But so some of them can be. Uh, but again, you really need to think about um, the length, um, you know, the items that I mentioned. Um, so some of those instruments are definitely um, can be appropriate, and I utilize some of them. Um, but again, it's really going to depend on the procedure that you're doing. So I wouldn't want to make a general statement that all of those instruments are useful. Uh, but it's certainly one area where you can look at, um, and it kind of limits for you in a way from all of the other items that are out there from all of the other areas. Uh, but again, if you're going to be doing, for example, in, uh, in a nerve anastomosis um, or, you know, a heart transplant, um, those instruments uh, will not be appropriate. You're going to really need to look at a mi human microsurgical instrumentation. Um, so, again, it's a good area to look at, and there's certainly some great instruments there um, that we can utilize. Uh, but again, you really need to look at the specific procedures um, and different items that, uh, that I mentioned in the presentation. So I, I hope that answers your question. The last question is not really a question, but it's more of a comment from Kim Tut from Research Animal Unit at University of Cape Town. Great. Wow. So her Comment is Kim's, uh, Kim's uh, comment is that steam sterilization also can also make fine instruments blunt and blunt them. So, do you, would you like to comment on that, Stefan? No, so 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 thank you for so thank you so much for that comment, and it certainly does. I mean, any type of cleaning that we're going to perform, it's going to um, blunt your instruments. Uh, so it's really important to how you place your instruments. Uh, so you use appropriate packaging uh, for, especially for microsurgical instrumentation, they're not touching each other, you know, that they're open. Um, but it is pretty much any technique that we utilize. But if you had to compare autoclaving versus using a bead sterilizer, there's really no comparison there. Uh, the bead sterilizer is going to damage those instruments um, a lot faster um, than autoclaving. So at this point, I'm not really familiar with any procedure that would not dull your instruments um, over time um, uh, when, when, when you do that. 
Well, it doesn't look like we have any any more questions. And so I want to thank the audience for their interest in questions and participation in today's event. And today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2015. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. So we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>